Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the previous lecture, we have mapped the uh, the ecosystem for the green supply chain. We have looked at all the four elements of the green supply chain, namely the supply chain itself and the resources and the institutions and the role the institutions and the social uh, organizations play and the delivery mechanisms. We have looked at in detail how all these four parameters affect your greenness of the supply chain. <coughs> now, having this map, which is the existing uh, situation for any uh, particular supply chain, so we need to uh, do the GRIP framework. That is, the GRIP is governance, risk, innovation, and performance framework. So, to, for this per framework, we basically proceed usually in the reverse direction that is the performance, innovation, risk and the finally the governance. And what is the kind of governance that is needed? What is the organization structure that is suitable for uh, for the green? How do you actually select the partners and so on is, are the issues. So, let us look at uh, first the, uh, the performance. So, but before all this, let us look at what is the strategy of a green supply chain. How do you want to build the green supply chain? <coughs> well, innovations and products and processes and business models to reduce resource usage, lessen the carbon footprint and use renewable energy resources. So, first of all, you should you should re-modify your products and processes and business models to do this. That is the first step. Second is use judicious combination of free innovations and carbon trade. So, if you want to reduce your carbon by some amount, mm -hmm. you could do it in two ways. As we said, one is carbon trading and second one is cradle to cradle protocol or re innovations. So, how much percentage each or you want to start doing only re innovations or you want to do fully carbon trading? or a mixture of this, that is the one that, that you need to define. And the functional model, where the function is what matters and can be utilized as long as it provides the intended needs. <coughs> now, for example, if you want to say uh, virtual travel, in other words, you can use video conferencing instead of travel, you can use digital communities instead of uh, physically meeting at one place. You can use functional foods where basically the functional foods instead of uh, uh, producing separate foods, you can put functional foods where you have vitamin enriched foods, you have mineral enriched foods and so on. So, basically these are all the things where the function is what matters. So, when you are meeting a gathering, you know communication and meeting is is important and seeing each other's face and communicating and clarity and understanding are important in communities. So, instead of that you need not have to meet at one place, you need not have to travel. You can save, save a lot of, uh, lot of carbon by having virtual, tra virtual travel and digital communities. And the services model is this is followed even now with the services model where ownership of the product is replaced by service offering. You need not have to own everything that you use car sharing, seller service not product, home delivery, electronic delivery and so on. So, basically this avoids the consumer traveling uh, to the retail stores. and identifying social hard constraints such as use of local green timber, 
coal power plants or livestock for meat etc and then follow the steps above. So, in other words whenever you are talking of a green supply chain design, you are faced with several problems. You cannot generate your own electricity, you have a solar plant, but all the power that is available in your neighborhood is coal power. What do you do? So, you are you are basically forced to use the coal power although it is not, not environmentally friendly, but you take this as a constraint and similarly for example, you have you want to have a green furniture and so on, but all your local timber is not green. So, if you want to import the timber which is green, then we is the green after import. So, you have to basically look at the social heart constraints and then look at the innovations and the functional models and the services models. You have to look at device strategy for your supply chain, what is possible? Can you share your transportation with somebody else or if you outsource it to some 3 PL then he shares it. So, your scope 2, scope 3 emissions come down. So, that is the supply chain strategy is the one that is fundamental first. Let us look at uh, the performance. So, in the performance usually the what are the what are the enablers for the green supply chain? In other words, <coughs> we have four uh, parameters in the uh, in the ecosystem value chain delivery institutions and resources. And what are the kinds of enablers for each which for green enablers? For example, the value chain if we have re-innovations, if we could do carbon trading, if we can estimate your GHG gases, if we can minimize your resources. In addition to your supply chain innovations like modularization uh, and so on. If you could do have all these three features and minimize your resources in your value chain, they become enablers in your value chain. We have gone through all this, I am just summarizing in, in a short pair uh, uh, on this. Similarly, in terms of the delivery mechanisms, if you have green transportation modes, reverse logistics, smart warehousing, if you have carbon trade, then in the delivery you have basically talking of green supply chains, you have also the software that is uh, to measure to measure the uh, uh, to measure the green warehouse gases and so on. <coughs> Well, institutions should follow green regulations, uh, emission caps, ISO 14000 regulations and all that. And in terms of resources, you have water power, cradle to cradle protocol, carbon markets and all that, they are all become the resources. Now, do you, when you are using your value chain is the one that uses the resources. So, it has to use the resource minimization without polluting and it reduces, it is the one that produces the GHG gases. So, it has to minimize the GHG gases and it has to have once the product is disposed of, it should have the facilities for re-innovation. So, once you have all these enablers, if you want you can add some more whatever, then what happens to the cost? <coughs> So, the cost is high product design cost, low production cost. So, what happens is if you have all these innovations, you bring uh, all of them to me. You have made all these investments, which are sometimes capital investments, which are asset specific investments. You make all this and then my low production cost is low because I am having a manufacturing process. You have given me all the resources, all the ways in which I can use less resources and so on. So, my production cost becomes less, but 
my design cost, product design cost becomes high. Why? My high product design cost because I have to design the product which is green, which is uses, uh, which uses material which is recyclable and also while the product is in use, it emits less GHG gases. So, I am basically designing a product with additional constraints, which is a green while manufactured during the manufacture and usage and it should be disposable. I should be able to recover as much material as possible or I should be able to refurbish it for use again. So, these are all the constraints the design teams have, so the design cost may increase. Now, if you want a green transportation cost in terms of the delivery, so you may have high transportation and inventory cost. Well, transportation cost could be could be low if you are using the, uh, the less number of transportation deliveries, but the inventory cost then you have to keep high inventories. So, the inventory cost goes up, but if you also insist that your transportation should be green, then the cost may go up. And cost of regulation, high environmental safety and so on, that is the, there are coordination costs associated with this. And in terms of resources, since you are recycling, and you are minimizing the use of resources in your design process. So, the low cost of resources due to resources. So, you can see in the ecosystem framework the effect of the green supply chain in this. So, your cost ultimately if you add up all the four, will it be less or more? It all depends. <coughs> In the initial stages of the design and the product development in the initial phase, probably the cost could be high, but as the product matures, the products could come down to lower levels. So, production and consumption costs include costs of input such as labor, capital, and do not fully reflect the cost of using environmental resources. In other words, uh, now what about GHG gases? <coughs> so, here in the green supply chain, we were in the earlier supply chains, we were using lead time and all that. Now, the parameters, the, the parameters that you need to measure for green supply chain performance, they include GHG gases. What happens to them? So, low if product is refurbished, high otherwise. So, GHG gases are lower, uh, lower because you are using all these innovations and your delivery GHG gases will be low, institutions the regulations will make it low and the water and because of the resources it is the GHG gases are low because you are using less uh, this one. So, basically your uh, uh, value chain GHG gases it becomes it becomes either either low or high in the value chain, but uh, uh, the otherwise it will be low. So, the, the point I am making here in this diagram is when you are looking at the performance, what are the performance parameters you are going to measure? A cost and B GHG gases. The GHG gases basically and C which are the value chain parameters where you are basically looking at and which it, which leads to low uh, GHG gases which leads to high GHG gases and so on so that you can talk to the decision makers and uh, try to make the changes appropriate. So, let us look at the transaction cost. 
you know, in the supply chain you have production, quality, reuse and recycling. You are adding these two phases. So, basically the cost of the supply chain may, may increase. And in the delivery you have the modes, inventory, recycling, reverse logistics, waste management. And in the resources you have the clusters, carbon markets, power emissions, natural resources, land, water and so on. And in terms of the institutions you have regulations, carbon taxes, gas emissions, ISO certification and so on. And finally, you have the coordination costs. So, you have to add all these costs and estimate your transaction cost. So, when you are doing the green supply chain design, you have to do your transaction costs are given given by this and that is where you if you want to compare your green product cost with uh, non-green product cost, you can eliminate your recycling and other reverse logistics and all that and it may happen sometimes that it will be more expensive or sometimes it happens that it may be less expensive because you are using less resources. Although you are doing in terms of your research and initially you are spending more money in terms of uh, finding out uh, uh, the methodologies for the use of less usage and all that. But ultimately because you are using less resources it may happen that the costs will come down. So, we have looked at the performance. Performance is basically the uh, the cost as well as the GHG gases and how each of these four parameters in the, the four elements of the supply chain ecosystem, they influence these costs. So, let us look at uh, the innovations here. The innovations, in the innovations uh, we have uh, <coughs> in the supply chain, we have cradle to cradle protocol, redesign of products to be modular, reuse friendly and processes to minimize waste and energy consumption. Well, you can call it an innovation because you are doing a redesign and design selection based on supply chain carbon footprint. So, your criteria for selection of the design, it changes, you are looking at the carbon footprint. And the business model selling eco-friendly solutions, home delivery and so on. Because you are looking at scope 1, scope 2, scope 3 solution uh, emissions here and your business model will be selling eco-friendly solutions. and eco-efficient procurement, manufacturing, distribution and transport. So, if you look at the supply chain, you are basically reinventing your supply chain. You are reinventing your supply chain in terms of procurement, manufacturing, distribution, your business models, your how you evaluate uh, your uh, uh, designs. Earlier it was lead time and cost. Now, lead time cost and the GHG gases and the carbon footprint. So, what about the innovations in, in the uh, institutions? It has to basically develop the standards for development, standards development, monitoring GHG gases and pollution levels. So, you require mechanisms for monitoring and reporting taxes and regulations that improve sustainability. So, you have to put pressure on both industry and city and ship so that uh, the taxes and regulations improve the sustainability. And what about delivery mechanisms, the, the innovations in delivery mechanisms? Re-innovations, well reuse, recycling and repair. 
inbound, outbound and diverse logistics design and mode selection, wellness and convenience and immediate packaging. So, when you are delivering you have to package this one and you have to basically environment friendly packaging and waste disposal. So, what are the innovations and resources? <coughs> Carbon trading and outsourcing, research labs. So, if you look at uh, the innovations in, uh, in this, this gives you a big list of innovations in each of these. So, I mean they can co evolve, you could say an innovation on re innovations and recycling and repair cannot survive on its own. It has to be your supply chain manufacturing process should be able to take whatever is refurbished, whatever is uh, reused or recycled here should be used in your manufacturing process. And you should have reverse logistics to transfer all this to those. And you should have research labs how to basically get uh, the use the uh, re recycled product into your original design. So, it becomes a co-evolutionary process in terms of uh, innovations and any innovation by itself does not mean much. You require cooperation of all the four elements in this. So, one thing the one advantage of using the ecosystem framework is you are seeing everything in itself and you can see each of these innovations ask the question in each of these innovations are they independent? The answer is no. Well, you may you may you may invent them independently, but when you are using in a mark for the market uh, marketed product, there independently if you try to use it, then it may not it may not work. So, you require in a way in, uh, uh, evolution, evolution of uh, all this, co-evolution. Now, what about innovations in the supply chain? That is what are the innovations that we talked about. Low carbon innovations are not new products and technologies. They include new services and processes in such industries as ICT, chemicals, agriculture, law, accounting and consulting. So, look at the examples, Dutch flower industry cultivate flowers in rock wool and transport in same trays reducing shipping time and cost. So, you can have innovations of, of the several different kinds, you, see, you need not have to find, uh, uh, you need not have to <coughs> have flowers grown in, in the land, you can do it, uh, uh, do it in trays. And Best Buy partnered with GE to bring new home energy management systems, smart appliances, renewable energy products to market more rapidly. Why? GE has a brand name and also GE has the experience in terms of uh, home energy management systems and all that. So, once you have the, all these uh, instruments here, you know how to manufacture, you should know how to market. So, Best Buy does that and similarly, they once you have a clean technology this one, there are always litigation services because their various partners, governments and others are involved. In case of a law dispute, then there should be some lawyers who understand all the issues. So, there is the Morrison and Foister LLP. They have a law practice which is focused on clean technology offering corporate and litigation services. So, their business is growing and automakers are adopting start stop battery systems from Johnson's control that turn vehicles engines off rather than idle when vehicles stop. So, there are various ways in which you can have innovations in energy. It need not have to be in the supply chain. It can be while usage here, 
this is an innovation while the usage is in this one. This is innovation in case of uh, uh, a dispute. This is innovation for marketing and here this is innovation for easy transport. And there are all our delivery innovations for example, video conferencing system we talked about this. It substitutes many forms of business travel. Hewlett Packard and its customers saved 66,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gas emissions in two years and HP reduced its employee business travel 43 percent, 43 percent. So, SAP introduced a carbon impact on demand 5.0 carbon management software in 2010 and they have an enterprise carbon accounting marketplace. And HP works with corporate customers to design, implement and manage an imaging and printing infrastructure. For one customer with 10,000 employees, HP reduced the printing energy consumption by 66 percent. For low carbon innovations to take root, companies must develop the necessary networks of external partners that enable them. So, it shows that the social networking within the community becomes extremely, extremely important for this whole thing to work, the innovations. There is a co-evolution of the innovations. There is also a co-evolution of the innovations beyond the supply chain into the markets innovations and so on. So, it is it is very important that uh, the, these innovations. So, what are the kinds of kinds of risk that uh, uh, you are talking about here? The green supply chain. So, companies need to understand how global warming would impact their supply chain. Assess potential climate related vulnerabilities such as new rainfall patterns, increased storm activity, higher prices of natural resources and potential political instability and energy insecurity. So, the point is when you are using resources you want to reduce the resource usage or if you want to say you want to uh, increase the, the resource security here, then you need to understand what are the changes that are happening due to global warming. If you have more GHG gases, why? What is the effect of them? So, if you have new rainfall patterns and if you have increased storm activity, what is the effect of yours? If you have increased storm activity and if you have a lot of uh, uh, shipping that happens and they get disrupted, then you get affected. So, higher prices of natural resources, how does that affect you? Higher price of water, if you are a Coca Cola company, then your higher water will affect your, uh, your bottom line. So, it is a there is a the, this green supply chain is much more than just the supply chain design. You need to understand the effect of all the what is the what is the effect of global warming and all this and what are the situations the risks that you are facing due to this global warming. For example, there is the drought because of the roads or there is excess rainfall and there are floods. So, how do you manage these kind of things for your business? So, if you look at this diagram, I think this is done by uh, a survey group, a center survey and policy uncertainty, policy uncertainty is the biggest risk factor that people talked about in the companies. Regulatory changes, tax subsidy changes. So, what government say is they accepted we will give you subsidies if you reduce your energy consumption, you reduce water consumption, if you reduce your GHG gases and so on. Those changes are dependent on the people 
and the government and had and the party in power and uh, they may change and the policy uncertainty also somebody may say I want fuel efficient cars and somebody else may say I want battery cars and somebody else may say something else basically everybody thinks that they are talking of the same thing which is environmental regulated uh, cars but a fuel efficient car is different from a battery operated car. <coughs> Market uncertainty that is the customer adoption competing technology standards that is the biggest another uncertainty that you face. Now because ultimately you may have a green product customer has to buy it and if all customers adopt the green and so you may have you may have more market and you may not have LS product so to basically uh, scale up your operations you may take time. And business feasibility, profitability and manageability. You can have all the innovations in the world for green this one, but is, the, are, they, is it, are they feasible, are they business friendly, can you make money out of this, will your customers like this. Technical uncertainty, performance criteria, life cycle, warranty costs and so on. So what somebody has done all this service is that they find that the the risk is 7.8 here for policy uncertainty and 6.8 for market uncertainty and for business feasibility 6.4 and technical uncertainty 5.8. So that is basically the, the risks that the supply chain faces. So if you look at the policy and market policy and market uncertainties uh, here, in more detail, many companies 65 percent named government policy uncertainty at the biggest risk. So sectors such as electricity are regulated both at federal and state levels, policies often vary by state by state. You know electricity, water, land, agriculture, these are all regulated both, both by states and as well as the center, center uh, federal government. So, and these policies change from state to state. So, you have to be careful about the policies. And national priorities shift with elections. For example, President Clinton's Clean Air Core Initiative, meaning fuel efficiency, safety, and less emissions, gave way to hydrogen fuel initiative of President Bush. And President Obama is focusing on electric cars. Now here is the is the difference. I mean, basically, people should understand clean air initiative and fuel efficient cars is much different from hydrogen cars, or much different from electric cars. So this is where it creates the policy uncertainty. And market acceptance, will customers pay more for electric cars and other highly fuel efficient vehicles? So the answer may depend change on the depend on fuel prices, the state of the economy and the government policies. You know for example in the United States you can use the fast lane if you are having a, a fuel efficient car. So, then that gives you more time and so on. So that gives you an, an incentive for this. And another thing that is happening is more and more companies are providing with outlets, electrical outlets for charging their cars. So basically you can charge your car using the company electricity. So you need to, you know, I mean, you, you can charge your car at home, but in case it is needed, you can charge. If your drive is long, then you can charge your, your batteries in the, uh, uh, at work when you are, when you are at work. So basically there are, there are several other issues that are important for market acceptance. 
So, what are the other benefits, other SOPs that the customers get? That becomes important when they are trying to look at uh, this, uh, this policy and market uncertainties. So, what are the other risks with uh, this one? I mean, if you look at the, uh, the kind of risk, that is, uh, <coughs> if you look at the supply chain, the, what are the risks? Pollutants during the production. So, this will raise lot of social activities because if you are if you are basically spoiling the water in this or spoiling the air and so on you have to you have to basically spend time and money to reduce the pollutant to clean the environment afterwards after polluting it you have to have waste disposal hazardous waste liability and recycling So, the waste disposal, I mean it takes time and energy and hazardous waste liability, if you have nuclear waste then you have to take it to ship it to some other place. Opportunistic behavior by partners and this is, this is basically somebody says it is a green material that does not does not supply it. Social government influence on buying patterns. So, once you have, uh, this is the market risk perceived non-commitment by top management. So, the top management of the company is, is may not be overly committed towards the green supply chains. They are interested only in making money and uh, this is only uh, for, uh, they may just agree for uh, its sake and product recalls and after effects. Supposing you do not follow the green uh, green environments and it has to be that the products are to be recalled. When you recall a product, then what are you going to do it? You have to dispose it off. What do you, how do you dispose it off? You cannot just dump them someplace on the road. You have disposal takes, you have to recycle them or uh, depending on the kind of product and uh, uh, that you have on this one. So, in the supply chain, you get into a lot of risks much more I mean the innovations in this. Well, in the resources, criminal insurance liability for violation and accidents. Supposing you you use more resources or more resources or you pollute the resources. Inability to identify and remedy non-compliance or risk. Yeah, how do you say, how do you prove that somebody has has not complied with uh, the regulations. Accident due to lack of training or awareness. Public pressure to ban or restrict raw materials. Neutral resource land uses deforestation and so on. So, basically in terms of resources, there could be several problems that you face. These are basically social and legal issues that are concerning the uh, land. You are dealing with the resources which are water, land and so on, which is basically public property and everybody is concerned about it. You are using the land and you are also involved in, in deforestation and the consequences. You are also involved in uh, basically uh, 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 spoiling the environment. So, who will pay for all this? In other words, the diseases that come due to this pollution and all that, who will pay? So, what about the institutions? Political social pressures for regulations, policy changes <coughs> as we have seen earlier, changes during elections. You know, they are the campaigns that people do during elections. Every election is a possibility that there is a risk. And of course, there is the delivery infrastructure, which is the reverse logistics and waste disposal infrastructure, operational readiness for accidents and lack of infrastructure. <coughs> so, you are basically looking at the entire risks that can happen in all this. One, one may say, but if by looking at this particular uh, diagram that uh, a particular slide that you may see it covers everything in the world, I am sure it is and that is where one has to be careful when 
there are new regulations that are coming in and you are dealing with you are promising the government and the society that you are going to be green and then if you do not follow the rules it can be criminal and insurance li liability and there will be political and social pressures to change regulations and there could be policy changes and you may have to spend lot of money on investment on new facilities like reverse logistics, recycling and so on and without knowing what is going to be the return on these investments. So, these are basically the risks that you face. So, finally, let us look at uh, the uh, governance uh, and the green supply chains, which means uh, that it is partner selection, coordination and execution. So, this is an important topic because it basically talking of we are talking of the design of the green supply chain. If you have observed, although we are talking of the grip framework, we are basically talking about the design of green supply chains. And the final point, we talked about the innovations, we talked about the risks it faces, we talked about the performance that uh, the measures, performance measures and so on. So, and all the innovations that you need to do from uh, the product innovations in terms of your design, in terms of uh, your leadership in the community with your stakeholders and all that. The final point is the governance. How do you select your partners? Who are your partners? Your suppliers, logistics providers and so on. So, if you want your supply chain to be green, it is important your partners are green. And how do you coordinate all these activities? And how do you execute it? So, ultimately, we have seen in several situations that the execution or the online control is an important part of this. So, it basically a separate chain is formed for each order. For example, it, uh, when you are talking of a green supply chain, if you are if you want to reduce your final delivery to the products is this one like if you are global cement company, if your order comes from a particular country or within the country or if they are you want to keep the demand changes, the supply demand changes in various countries, then you have to basically select your partners where which plant you are going to produce the cement and who are your logistics partners, how you are going to transport and meet the demand. There, there are SS specific capabilities and relational ties and so on. So, while selecting the partners you have to take as we have seen, we have we, we have looked at the government regulations, we have take, like, looked at the asset specificity of the partners in the green supply chain, you have to take all those things into account and do the partner selection. You can use optimization, social network analysis and all that. Of course, coordination is determining who does what and when and communicating to everyone and it involves supply chain planning and invisibility. And finally, we have a control tower to monitor the status so that processes work as per plan and control exceptional events. Of course, one thing we have to do, the difference, this is the same thing as that we have for an ordinary supply chain. But in case of the uh, green supply chain, you have to select partners who are green, you have to coordinate so that the for that order the all the green requirements are met and you have to execute. In addition to others, you have to monitor the GHG gases, your carbon footprint and so on. So, your execution and control here you add the additional features of your reverse logistics and also your monitoring of the GHG gases and so on. So, in the partner selection of course, it is uh, we identify suppliers from various components and services from all over the globe and we shortlist them based on 
location, country policies, delivery costs, asset specificity, risk proneness, innovation capabilities, technology sophistication and so on. And optimization you can use uh, uh, transaction cost economics, social networks for the pre-selection process. So, basically you can you can use any one of these techniques to select the partners, but you should you should you should understand that if you are talking of green then your as asset specificity is important and your risk proneness becomes important where considered various risks particularly with reference to the green this one and look at the country's policies and technology sophistication and hard and soft infrastructure and so on. So, basically if you are if you are if you are using <coughs> the mode selection and all that becomes important. <coughs> so, the coordination the transaction costs are the costs incurred to coordinate and connect all links in the global supply chain and relate to finding a suitable trading partner, negotiating, setting up the contract and monitoring compliance with the selected partners. And there are observable costs and soft costs, trans transport costs, import duties and all that are observable costs and there are soft costs for information gathering and so on. So, the transaction costs here we have seen the, the diagram in the part, partner selection or you have to add the additional costs of uh, the, uh, the for the green to maintain greenness in the this one. The hard observable cost decrease with trade liberalization a decrease in transport costs and soft costs of social connections gain important, but the hard uh, uh, cost basically uh, may, may decrease because of the green uh, uh, regulations and all that, but the soft costs uh, are important. So, the coordination is basically is determining who does what when and communicating to everyone and the coordination includes software based methods for every order selecting the suppliers assigning functions to them such as what to supply, how to how is it produced and the production delivery schedules given the product specification and communicating to all the partners. This is the usual uh, thing that one does, but one has to uh, take care that you are dealing with a green product and you have to communicate uh, the various things in this. So, if you look at the control tower that is the the network governance coordination and all this. You have various suppliers, various logistics players and so on for the supply chain and for each order you select a player and you have the basically the, the governance, the partner selection here and coordination and execution and when you are doing the partner selection you have to basically be careful while selecting uh, the, the partners who are green and also the logistics players who are green, you have to select the appropriate mode of uh, mode of transport for each of this. So, once you do all this and then you have to coordinate tell them what to do and you have to execution tower where you have to monitor the various things like GHG gases and others to, uh, to in addition to whether everything is going to as per plan and so on. So, as far as the, the coordination is concerned, it could be the same supply chain planning as earlier, but execution involves more than the supply chain because you are doing the execution of both the forward as well as the reverse supply chains. So, the network governance becomes more complex in the case of the green supply chains. So, basically what we have done so far is the GRIP framework 
and in terms of uh, this the green supply chain design is a complex exercise with the risks of non-compliance from partners. So, you have to basically not only monitor your, your processes, but also look at <coughs> your supply chain partners. Totally green products as currently being sought after may not be a feasible proposition. It requires collaborative developments across all partners. So, this may particularly if you are a global supply chain partner, then it may be very difficult to achieve this. A feasible gain solution that is a balance between resource use, carbon footprint, customer acceptance and profitability is the one that should be sought after. And this is vertical product dependent. In other words, you cannot make make uh, uh, this uh, this one. For example, you buy a refrigerator, you buy it only once and you use it every day and you buy a car, you use it every day. So, basically the impact of all these equipments are is felt every day and day in and day out and any regulations on energy usage, any regulations on your on the, on the patterns by the government influence of those. So, those are the kinds of verticals that are uh, maybe, maybe should be targeted first. Then others like furniture, you buy once and you basically once you buy a furniture, there is no expenditure involved in maintaining it. There is no daily usage of this except for cleaning. So, one has one need to one need to concentrate on those particular verticals which are basically very uh, daily use and are they product dependent can be used with advantage with SMEs, hospitals, cities and villages in this. You know the same kind of uh, design you can design a green green village, you can talk of green cities. So, whenever you are using this for uh, hospitals, cities and villages, you should treat those entities as a bundle of services. A, a city is a bundle of services, water, power and so on, you make each one of those services green, like then you can apply our technology for each of them and integrate them as a whole. And similarly, you can make a village as, as a bundle of services, you can take hospital as a bundle of services. It has building, it has uh, operation theater, it has various diagnostic uh, resources. So, everything you can take as a service, as a service chain and you can map the green uh, service chain and integrate a whole, integrate them as a whole and that will become a green hospital. So, for each of them these techniques can be applied. <coughs> 